Welcome to Kalos' Gaming Table. I'm Kalos. On this channel I talk about tabletop RPGs, miniature war games, and today we're going for another rambling walk after work. Work wasn't too bad. We actually had some high-level bigwigs in the office today. <clears throat> Coming to check out the site. I think this is the first time they visited it. And... Once I got to schmooze with them, but I did get to fix a couple of IT issues, get in, get out, and I was pretty much on call the entire time just in case something needed to be fixed or they needed something worked on, so that was fun. Finally got out of there, though, and now I'm out for a walk because I am needing to get out into the fresh air, and as much as I love technology and computers, I must say the call of the green space is pretty pretty big you know when I worked in Calif worked from home in California same kind of thing as soon as I got off of work rain or shine <laughs> whether it was raining or not I would go out and usually go for a an hour walk sometimes more depending upon how the day went I've got a, a nice oil skin duster that keeps me nice and dry during the the rainy season, so don't have to worry about that. But, so I'm not sure what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, something very interesting that uh, I read, uh, the director, Matthew Vaughn, was looking to, well, not looking to, but he made the suggestion that Star Wars needs to be rebooted, or at least soft rebooted, possibly hard rebooted, depending upon <laughs> where you're at with the current lore and I got to thinking about it it'd be interesting to say the least and I'm not sure how they would do it considering there is so much current Star Wars in production right now whether it's the various TV shows you know the Bad Batch Mandalorian Ahsoka all of that but you know I'm not sure I'm opposed to it, to be perfectly honest. I mean, I've been a diehard Star Wars fan, you know, from the first time I saw the Rebel Blockade Runner screaming across the sky, well, screaming across space uh, above Tatooine, followed by that Star Destroyer. So, you know, I've been a fan for you know, a hot minute. And I've seen a lot of the ebb and flow of the franchise, you know, like... Like a lot of people, I kind of figured that Star Wars was, you know, kind of dead after Return of the Jedi, and there was no real prospect of anything new, you know, ignoring the two Ewok movies, the droid cartoon and the Ewok cartoon. We, we never expected, you know, anything more. Um, it was, for me at any rate, at about that point, you know, I got into the Western Games role-playing game, and... <clears throat> A lot of the quote-unquote lore, that's where I absorbed it from, you know. Again, not expecting anything new officially from Lucas or Lucasfilm. And then, you know, Timothy Zahn's Heir to the Empire trilogy came out in, what, 90, 91, somewhere around there? And that, in a lot of aspects, helped reignite Star Wars, because all of a sudden, you know, we actually had new adventures. <clears throat> and... I still go back and reread the, the that original Thrawn trilogy, so I thought it was uh, really well done. It definitely had a, a feel for Star Wars, and I thought Zahn captured the essence of the characters. My biggest complaint about it was all of the names, especially of like metals and materials, because it felt... <laughs> It looked like he was able to type a bunch of that stuff out, but I couldn't even pretend that I would want to even try to pronounce some of the names, especially like some of the metals that Calrissian was harvesting. But yeah, you know, that's neither here nor there. But a reboot of Star Wars, the, the question would be, are we going to go back to like the original trilogy? Are we going to do, try and do the Skywalker Saga, because I'll be perfectly honest, as big a fan as I am of, you know, Luke Skywalker, I like the character overall, 
I'm really tired of the Skywalkers at this point. We've had nine movies. You know, however you want to look at it, going back to the original trilogy, Luke Skywalker. Eventually, you know, we find out, you know, he's got a sister. And we've got the prequel trilogy. And, you know, you've got Anakin Skywalker, the child, the Padawan, the Jedi, and, you know, his eventual fall to Darth Vader. And then even in the, the sequel trilogy, you know, it, it's still kind of revolving around the Skywalkers because, you know, Rey needs to somehow find Luke Skywalker. Luke Skywalker has to teach her. And then, you know, Rise of Skywalker. Yeah, well, yeah. The point being, you know, we've had nine movies with the Skywalkers being the center of it. And how much more do we want to see the Skywalker clan screwing up the galaxy? That I'm not interested in. I think that's one of the reasons why I really took to The Mandalorian. Because, one, it's... You don't see a whole bunch of Jedi, at least until, you know, later seasons. It's, you know, this dude in bounty, bounty hunter armor moving around doing his thing, you know, kind of lone wolfing and cub with uh, the child. But, you know, even after Return of the Jedi, a lot of people still think of the Jedi as kind of this ancient myth that, you know, 30 years ago might have been a big thing, but after the Empire worked to wipe them out, nobody saw them, you know, no big deal. Nobody cared. You know, there was some myth, you know, a boogeyman or a, a Bigfoot or something like that, something that people might have claimed to have seen. You know, some people probably were still alive during the Clone Wars, but, you know, the younger generations, <laughs> yeah, whatever, old man, go, uh, go drink your blue milk. But, I mean, are we going to talk about, you know, the Rebellion era? I mean, personally, that is my favorite era of Star Wars, but that's the one I really grew up on. I mean, the West End Games pretty much encompassed that, that period uh, between A New Hope and Return of the Jedi. That's what I really, that's the area that I really enjoy. I think it's the most fleshed out of all of them. But I mean, at the same time, to an extent, I did like the original, the uh, prequel trilogy because it was also for me very cool to see lots of Jedi moving around as opposed to them being a rarity you know they might not be on every street corner but at that point you know the Jedi were still a pretty imposing figure and you know you see somebody moving around with a lightsaber you know you, you probably gave them a wide berth because you probably don't want to tangle with somebody like that but I don't know. People keep saying like, you know, they did it with Star Wars, with, with Star Trek. Yeah, they kind of did. I mean, you got the Chris Pine, Zachary Quinto, you know, soft reboot, but at the same time, they're familiar characters with a familiar setting. Are we looking to completely recast the original trilogy? You know, how are we looking to update them? I mean, one of the things that I really enjoyed about Lucas's vision was it was fairly consistent. Uh, when they were starting to work on the visual effects for uh, Phantom Menace, you know, these, you know, CGI had become the, the hot thing and it still is, but, you know, these artists were showing Lucas, you know, hey, look, we got these lightsabers and now we can do all these neat things with them, make, you know, more lights dance and put all kinds of, you know, shapes and images, and, you know, Lucas said, no, that, that's not the lightsaber. Even, you know, the lightsaber, you know, he wanted them to look like they did in the original trilogy for that consistency's sake. Even with the, you know, the, the holographic transmissions, you know, they sure the technology improved, but they still made them look as consistent as they could with, you know, Princess Leia giving her message to R2-D2. Help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi, you're my only hope. And it was just, you know, he had a vision, and say what you will about it, he was consistent with it, at least. And, and I can respect that. 
what I, what I find absolutely hilarious, and I say that a lot, but I do find it comical, is that, you know, people shit the bed when Lucas sold to Disney. And now they're talking about, oh, you know, Lucas, you know, he should buy it back. Well, one, that's not going to happen. You know, Disney paid, what, $4 billion for the Lucasfilm archive. They've at least made that money back in one movie when they released The Force Awakens. You know, through ticketing, ticket sales, merchandising, the whole shebang. And whether you loved or hated the, the next two movies, they were more than profitable. Exceptionally profitable. And I don't see Disney selling Star Wars anytime soon because much like with Marvel, Star Wars is, you know, basically a printing press. So long as they own that, they can print money. And they're, they're doing a you know, pretty good job of that. You know, a bunch of older people hate, you know, that what Disney's done with it. I have my doubts and reservations. I mean, I liked all three of the, the sequel trilogy movies. Some more than others. I like the fact that it did go kind of in a different direction than what I was expecting, but at the same time, it did, to an extent, give us some new stuff. Now, I know what you're going to say, that uh, The Force Awakens is just a new hope redressed for a modern audience, and you're not wrong. I mean, looking at it beat for beat, yeah, I can certainly see that. But, you know, Ryan Johnson, I do enjoy him as a director. I've liked several of the movies that he saw. I didn't hate his movie. And I could have done without the whatever it was on the, the gambling planet. I, I didn't find that too interesting, but I liked his idea that Ray wasn't some special chosen one, that she was just somebody from a backwater planet or a back sand planet, since, you know, Jakku was, you know, Tatooine with, you know, the name filed off. I think my biggest complaint about the sequel trilogy and you know this has been talked to death by so many others was the fact that there was no overarching story because you can't tell me from what we saw in the force awakens and then what we got in the rise of skywalker that was the plan and if it was that entire writing room needs to be fired you know visually i did enjoy the last movie I thought it had some great set pieces. I thought it had some awesome moments. Yes, it was a bit predictable, but I think The Rise of Skywalker is also what happens when you try to cater to the fans. And I'm going to use air quotes, the fans, because there is no unified fan base for Star Wars. Let, let's be honest. Because you're going to have the people that are like the diehard original trilogy. Nothing... There's no Star Wars after that. Then you're going to have those that only believe in the expanded universe and hate to be that guy. But the expanded universe, the extended universe, whatever they're calling it, Legends, I think it's been rebranded. It's its own separate universe, but it was never canon to what George Lucas' vision was. He's even said it. And I'll be honest, most of I read almost all of the novels... I will probably can't make that claim since I stopped at the Yuzivong War. I did not like that story arc. I did not like them as, as an antagonist. They just felt like, you know, space xenobites in Star Wars. They just didn't do it for me and I could not get into it. But I read just about everything up to that. Most of the trilogies, the big books, and again, my biggest issue with all of those, or the vast majority of those, was the fact that it still revolved around the original trilogy cast. Luke Skywalker, you know, he's a big, you know, big hero in some of these shows up. Leia Organa Solo, Han Solo, Chewbacca, obviously. Lando pops up, but I mean, it's a giant galaxy. You can't tell me that these seven or eight characters have to be the center of attention for every freaking story. I just don't see that. I think the my favorite 
my favorite story after the Thrawn trilogy is the X-Wing series by Mike Stackpole. And one of the reasons that that story, that whole series, you know, was just great for me was the simple fact that it didn't revolve around the Skywalkers or the original trilogy cast. Wedge and Tilly's popular character, but you know, he is what two minutes of screen time in A New Hope. Uh, about the same in Empire Strikes Back, and you know, maybe a few more minutes in Return of the Jedi. You know, he's the only pilot that I'm aware of that has actually survived two runs up against the, a Death Star, so, you know, he's got that going for him, but the fact that, you know, the, the whole thing was around him and his attempt to rebuild Rogue Squadron and all the politics that went into that, I just really enjoyed it. I also like the fact that it was based so far after Return of the Jedi that Coruscant hadn't been taken yet. Uh, and, you know, building up to all of that, you know, that the Empire was still there, the Empire was still a viable threat, and sure, <laughs> the Emperor was killed, and the second Death Star was destroyed, and Vader was now dead, but the simple fact of the matter is the Empire isn't just going to roll over and die. But going back, one of the reasons, in my opinion, that the Marvel Cinematic Universe at least up into the latest phase, has been so dominant is because it had an overarching story. It had a consistency because it had, like, the head, the head honcho in Kevin Feige. You know, basically, you want to make a movie? Sure. You've got to hit these plot beats, incorporate these into your story somewhere, somehow. Other than that, go wild. It truly felt like, you know, three separate directors directed the sequel trilogy, and J.J. Abrams is a good to decent writer, but yeah, he catered to, he tried to swing the pendulum back from the second movie, trying to, you know, bring all the fans back in, you know, which is why you had so much fan service in that, whether it be the return of Lando, all of those ships, you know, Wedge and Tilly's, you know, having a 15 second cameo. Woo. And, you know, we had The Force Awakens, you know, where effectively we had a third Death Star. I mean, that's one of my biggest annoyances with Return of the Jedi. We've already had a Death Star. Now we're going to have, now it's bigger. It's badder. And then same kind of thing with The Force Awakens. We've had now three Death Stars. You know, you can call it Starkiller Base all you want, but some fact of the matter is it's a giant freaking planet-sized behemoth with a super laser that can destroy, you know, everything in its path. And then you had... The, the Rise of Skywalker, and now all of a sudden, you know, all these planet-destroying super lasers are built on Star Destroyers. You know, that... We've, we've done this. Why are we doing this again? I mean, to an extent, it did work with the Return of the Jedi, but, you know, that, that I just didn't like. What they should have done is had a series of writers sit down and say, here is the story that we're looking to tell, because you can't tell me that Palpatine has somehow returned what was supposed to be the big epic return, you know, villain. I was expected that, uh, oh God, my brain is fried, but I didn't, I don't believe for a second that that was the plan, and I'm sure Ian McKellen was happy to get some more screen time, but yeah, no. Kylo Ren. I was expecting him to, you know, take charge of the Empire and, you know, forge off in his new path, trying to follow in the footsteps of who he seemed to idolize, Darth Vader. You know, never meet your heroes, I guess. But they should have had, like, a clear plan, because, I mean, George Lucas can also say that he had a clear plan between you know, linking Star Wars, Empire, and Jedi all together, but let's, uh, let's ignore, you know, the kiss on Hoth, 
and you know the fact that Skywalker kind of you know obviously had the hots for Leia in A New Hope and yeah but you know he did his best to link the, the the stories together and I think the reason why Empire was such a better movie than the original Star Wars is because it did have different writers it got some different treatments and it had a different director Lucas is a visionary he's He's got a very set vision. He's got the, the way that he wants things to be. But I can only imagine what A New Hope would have been like if Marshall Lucas hadn't edited it together. You know, you know she helped just as much as Lucas to, to keep Star Wars a, a New Hope, allowing it to do what it did, so. At any rate, I'm now rambling on about Star Wars. I, I can only imagine what they would try and do. Would they even, if they tried to reboot it, would they even, you know, try and go with the Skywalkers, or would they go something else? You know, that that's the thing. I mean, they might, they might try to do that and retell the story, but again, with so much active in production and actual, you know almost 50 years of, you know, Star Wars based upon the original items, you know, it's kind of different, kind of difficult. And no matter what they do, it's always going to piss off the fan base because there are still the people that are pissed off about everything Disney's done. And after reading some of the excerpts of what Lucas had planned for his third trilogy, <laughs> I'm not sure that... Uh, it would have been much better. And for all the people that say Lucas should buy it back, y'all are probably the same people that shit all over him when he put out the original trilogy. So, not the original trilogy, the, the, the prequel trilogy. All those people that just screamed about how bad it was, how it ruined their childhood. You know, if, if a movie ruins your childhood, like that seek professional help because you've got bigger issues than than uh, than that so so I am uh, what most people would probably call a Star Wars apologist because I have found you know to an extent something good in all of the Star Wars products I mean I read some of the comics you know I read most of the novels still sometimes listen to the radio dramas because yes Star Wars did have a radio drama uh, all three of the original movies I think it was on NPR and they managed to get the music from John Williams and a lot of the sound effects from you know Industrial Light and Magic Skywalker Sound I guess it would be and then also even some of the original cast Hamill uh, provided the voice of Skywalker in both uh, in the first two, Anthony Daniels, C-3PO, and I, I really enjoyed it. If you're into theater of the mind and listening to things like that, especially if you can kind of fill in some of it after having seen Star Wars, you know, I, I think it's really good and you can probably find it on YouTube. Not sure how well it'll be. Or if it'll be, you know, butchered or anything like that. But check it out. But. I enjoyed. I've enjoyed all of the TV shows that they've put out so far. Some more than others. I mean, hands down. The Mandalorian's my favorite show. Andor's in a close second. But that's only because we've only had one season of it. And I think and or more than any of the others kind of shows the the rebellion from more of a civilian point of view because really I'm sure you see the rebels on Hoth and all of that but you don't really get to see how they interact with the Empire you know there was the I mean you see some of the cutscene of the scenes at the end like where they go to the various planets but you don't really see the fight taken to the Empire 
uh, on like a smaller level, you get to see the big heroes do it, but you don't see all the infighting, all of the insurgencies, all of that. You know, Rogue One is probably my second or third favorite Star Wars movie, again, because it is, it has that feel of the classic trilogy, but it shows us the fight at that level, because, you know, Jen or so, she's just some woman who happened to be the daughter of a brilliant scientist, but it's not like she went on and did sciencey things. She became an insurgent, she became a, a criminal, and she rose to the occasion. She did what she needed to do, and spoiler alert, ultimately it did cost her her life, but Andor's the same way. You know, we, when we first see Andor, in the show, you know, he, he looks to be fairly new to a lot of this, not as, I don't know, polished as an operative as he, as he was in Rogue One. You know, but he got there. And then, you know, you've got Stellan Skarsgård, you know, his absolutely brilliant performance. I still, you know, watch his speech about what he's given up, you know, because that, that is just some epic writing. And then I think my favorite episode of that is still, I think it's One Way Out, the Prison Break episode with Andy Serkis. And, you know, again, we got to see a side of the Empire, a side of Star Wars that we hadn't seen before. You know, the, the prison system. And <laughs> I could totally see a lot of that happening, you know. Shifting prison sentences. And then, you know, when somebody's getting ready to be released... <laughs> They just transform to a new area and you know the whole process starts all over again and nobody knows about it because there's no communication it's only after they start communicating with each other and realizing you know that an entire cell block got wiped out and all these people were supposed to have been released and nope they got they got killed but yeah some good stuff there the Book of Boba Fett had a good premise, but I think they tried to reform the character too much because I could totally see Boba Fett being a crime boss. You know, he's now much older. He's, you know, survived the guts of the Sarlacc. And that probably gives you some perspective on life. How he tried to do it and some of the story in there, yeah. I did not like the episode Robert Rodriguez directed because, well, it was obviously a Robert Rodriguez episode. The, uh, <laughs> the kids on the Vespas, you know, that was, I mean, if that had been edited better, if there was actually a bit more action, you know, speed those guys up to like actual speeder bike scenes, speeds, that would have been a lot more exciting, but I think it was just them putting something in to try and, you know, appeal, you know, appeal to George Lucas since, you know, cruising was uh, cruising in cars and stuff like that was a big part of his childhood. I mean, uh, yeah. Let's see. Ahsoka started off slowly. It was kind of hit and miss, but it definitely got better, especially towards the end. And while I realize it's called Ahsoka, it's really, you know, Rebel Season 5. I enjoyed it. I, I really liked the performance of the guy that played Thrawn. I will probably now read all that in his voice whenever I read the Thrawn trilogy again. Was he the same character in the Zahn trilogy? No. But I still got that menacing intelligence and the fact that you know he's willing to sacrifice a small amount of his forces to reach his end goal, but he didn't throw forces away like, you know, the Emperor Vader might have. And I'm still curious to see what he's going to do on Dathomir with, you know, the surviving witches. Uh, Obi-Wan, again, it was kind of hit and miss for me. It was awesome to see Ewan McGregor in the role again because, you know, Alec Guinness, yeah, he's old man Obi-Wan but Ewan McGregor he absolutely owns that role he I thought he, he was the best part of that 
And I mean, you know, the final fight between him and Vader, I just thought was <sighs> one of the best things that Star Wars has ever put out. And, you know, speaking of that, I think that all these new TV shows have helped give Hayden Christensen a bit of a redemption arc because, you know, he got shit upon so much for his wooden performance in uh, Attack of the Clones and Revenge of the Sith. But the thing you have to remember, that's the performance that Lucas wanted. During all of the takes, all of his direction, those were the performances that he felt were the best. So I put a lot of that onto Lucas, not Christensen. You know, same with uh, Jake Lloyd. You might hate that performance that the kid gave, and I feel sorry for him because you've got this dream job, and it pretty much, you know, <laughs> drove him to a life of crime. Ahmed Best, playing Jar Jar Binks, got his redemption in uh, Obi-Wan as well. Because, I mean, yeah, same kind of thing. He got bullied and, and berated and everything on, you know, what should have been a dream job. And, you know, you might not like Jar Jar Binks. Blame the writer, blame the director. It wasn't like... <laughs> I doubt Ahmed Best came in and said, Well, Lucas, how about if... How about we talk like this? Or, you know, whatever. You know, that that's... That's not the actors. That's the writer and that's the director. That's my opinion. Do I like the character Jar Jar Binks? No, but I wouldn't... I wouldn't attack the actor for doing his job, especially if that's the direction that he was given for the performance. Straight up. But Obi-Wan, I did enjoy most of it. There were a few few things. I'm not so sure about the whole young Princess Leia bit. I mean, it was good to see Bail Organa again. I thought Jimmy Smith was a very good actor for that. But, you know, I'm not the writer on that, and, you know, we'll see. Based upon the ratings, and despite his desires, I don't expect a second Obi-Wan story to emerge, especially since, you know, he's supposed to be a hermit on Tatooine. But, uh, I, I really enjoyed the Ahsoka show, especially because we got to see the live-action versions of the characters, seeing the ghost as, you know, even if it was a 3D model, you know, whatever, I thought it looked amazing. And certainly hit me in the feels, especially on the episode where Ahsoka got hit, fought uh, Balin, and got thrust into, you know, the world between worlds. And then, you know, her trip down memory lane with Skywalker during the Clone Wars. That was uh, pretty cool. What you gonna do? And I wasn't sure about Rosario Dawson as Ahsoka either. I was really kind of hoping that they get the actual voice actress to play it, you know, kind of like they did with Bo-Katan and uh, some of the others, but the best part of Ahsoka is Ray Stevenson. And I am upset, well, not upset, I am saddened, especially that he passed before we could actually get more backstory about Balin, find out about his time in the Jedi Order, find out about his time outside of the Jedi Order after the fall of the, new, of the Old Republic and the rise of the Empire, because <laughs> that man saw some shit and he knew what was coming. The look of resignation on his face when he knew that he was going to have to fight Ahsoka despite trying to not and just his general reserve he was definitely a different antagonist as opposed to you know the menacing or glowering Darth Vader or any of the other ones he was definitely an antagonist but I wouldn't call him a villain because yeah he did some bad stuff but he's got his own motivations he <laughs> And I do hope that they recast him because that is such an amazing character. And I'm not sure who they would cast for it. 
but some of these are going to have to have that imposing physique because Ray Stevenson was a big guy. You know, whether he was Titus Pullo in Rome, Frank Castle in uh, Punisher War Zone, I thought he was much better than Thomas Jane in the role. But then again, I'm so over origin stories, I'm kind of glad that they just picked picked him up, thrust him in as an established character. But, you know, we'll see. So, if you're a Star Wars fan, what do you think about Matthew Vaughn's idea of rebooting the Star Wars series? Do you think it can be done? If so, what kind of stuff would you like to see? I definitely don't want to see more Skywalker stuff. I'd love, I want to see Jedi. I'd love to see the space. I want to see new planets. You know, that was the one of my biggest gripes about uh, the Mandalorian was the fact that you know they kept going back to Tatooine. You know, we've seen Tatooine in you know multiple movies. Well, let's pick someplace else. Let's go do something else. Let's go do something new. And in general, that's, you know, the Mandalorian's done a pretty good job of that. But, you know, keep going back to the well. And, again, I'd like to see something else. But what are your thoughts? Do you like Star Wars? What do you think about rebooting it? Did you like the extended trilogy? Extended trilogy. Expanded universe, legends, whatever the hell they're calling it now. But, uh, yeah. Well, I'm going to head back to the hotel. Leave any comments that you have below. I'll catch you next time.